Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone here to worship at First Baptist. We're so glad that you joined with us this morning. Uh, if you are guests here with us this morning, we hope that you feel welcome and part of the family. Uh, if you'll all do us a favor, if you will uh, let us know of your attendance here. So if uh, you can text your name and those with you uh, to the number you see on the screen. For those who are watching at home, if you'll text home. And for those here in the service, if you'll text here, we would very much appreciate it. Uh, today is an exciting day on for many fronts, but one, our youth uh, have left for their mission trip early this morning, about seven o'clock. They met here and uh, they are headed to Baltimore to work in, on mission for this week. And so we would ask that y'all be in prayer for them. Uh, for those that are ministering and those they are ministering to. So we expect great things to happen uh, through them and we're looking forward to hearing about what God has done when they return. Also this week, our children are gonna be at South Mountain Camp. They'll be leaving tomorrow, so please be in prayer for them as well this week. A couple of other quick announcements. Uh, our Meals on Wheels ministry has uh, gotten started back. We've had a lot of people sign up for that, which is wonderful. All of the regular routes are filled, uh, but there's still space for those who can fill in and be a sub every once in a while. So if you are available to be a sub, uh, please let uh, Doris Hickson know as soon as possible. And one last thing, uh, we've also had several who have um, agreed to work in our preschool Sunday school, and, but we do need a few more. So if you're able to be a teacher with our preschoolers on Sunday morning, uh, we uh, need to have you. So if you will contact D. Elliott as soon as possible. Now, Lloyd Pace, if you'll come and uh, open us up in prayer. Shall we pray? Our most kind, precious Heavenly Father, we want to stop and say thank you for the beauty of this Sunday morning. Thank you for all the many blessings you give us each and every day. But most important, thank you for sending your son to us years ago to die on that cross for all our sins. And all we have to do is believe in you and our sins will be forgiven and we'll we will be with you forever in heaven. Be with Brian this morning as he presents your word to us. Help us to hear and understand this message. Later, as we exit through these doors and enter the mission field, let us take these words we have heard to help spread your word and kingdom. All these things we ask in your name. Amen.
On that day, there will be one Lord and the name and his name, the only name. Would you please stand as we sing all hell the power of Jesus name and what a beautiful name. Please stand.
Today is our work day where we are tearing down walls and baseboards and we have volunteers that are here uh, putting their hands to the plow, getting us ready to debut to the community. Just wanted to serve the community just like um, Jesus would. Of what we do on the last Saturday of every month is getting involved in things like cleaning up elementary schools to working with little kids and reading to them or working with animals, clothing drives, uh, food shelters, just various uh, projects to kind of serve the city and to love the city and to be people that are concerned with the welfare of our city, whether it be the orphan or the widow, kind of engage with those that have been marginalized by our society by kind of literally like washing their feet and bringing the basin and the towel to uh, every person that comes here. Hey, I'm getting a haircut. Today we're working with various churches that have picked Saturn at, for their service day and we're cleaning the classrooms and we're doing things that the teachers have requested. Painting bookcases, steam cleaning the area rugs and just trying to do some basic cleaning and prepping to help the teachers get ready for the new year. Uh, I'm replacing a doorstop that apparently has been broken for many, many years. We just changed the teacher's life. Look at that. Amazing. Today we have about 13 to about 14 volunteers and they've all volunteered their time and taken time out of their day. So we're grateful.
What a good morning already, amen? It's nice to have a choir up here singing. Um, just about all of our Sunday school classes are back together, and how good is that? Um, and, and the Lord's working. Uh, this morning, as, as Russ said earlier, uh, helped put the kids on the van, and along with a couple of our good adults, Betsy and Pete Teague. I'm Pete Teague. No, Pete's here. Pete Bogle, the other Pete. Um, and they headed up, talked to Betsy about 10.30, and they were just outside of Petersburg, Virginia. I uh, want to pray for them as they head up to do work in, in Baltimore. And I'm leaving as soon as I can after the service, and I'm driving up there, be up there sometime this evening. So just want to um, pray for, for that and what God's going to do. I watched the video, and I thought, wow, a lot of that is like what we're going to be doing in the Transformation Center. And I also really want you to pay... Um, Pay, pay a little bit of attention, give a little bit of time to us on um, Wednesday evening. We'll be doing a community block party. It's going to be a luau. Uh, what a luau looks like in Baltimore, I have no idea. But um, every time we've worked with the folks at Streetlight Ministry and at the, um, at the uh, uh, Transformation Center, this is a new center they have, God is blessed. And I'm just excited about what, what God's going to do through us but also, especially for our students, what God's going to do to us, what God is going to do during this time. I think uh, for the kids that we have, this could be a great time of, of discipleship, a great time of just seeing where they stand in the Lord and, and what God's doing. And so I appreciate that. Um, and then I'll have the opportunity to preach there next week. Um, David Norris will be preaching for us uh, next Sunday, so looking forward to that. But um, God's, God's just blessing us in so many ways as a church. And um, Let's go to the Lord in prayer now, if we could. And, and I'm going to ask you to pray for our team as we do this as well. Father God, I thank you that we can go on mission as we walk out these doors. Lord, we can go on mission as we look down the pew. And I thank you for that. Lord, for our team as they head up, I pray that you continue to give them traveling mercies. But more importantly, Lord, I pray that you would show off through them even on the drive up. Lord, as they go, Lord, let your message be seen and heard. Lord, it be a time of growth for all of us. Lord, we just pray that, that you would just do amazingly greater than we could even dream of through this time of mission for um, our students and adults in Baltimore this week. We pray that you would just uh, open hearts to hear your message. Lord, open eyes for us to see opportunities to deliver that message. Lord, for this time of worship right now, I just pray that you would just get me out of the way. Lord, I pray that what is said is only what you want said. Anything else, Lord, keep me quiet. But Lord, don't let me leave out anything you want me to share. Lord, let us be a blessing in all that we do. In your name I pray, amen. Well, have you all ever seen a show, watched a show, that gave you such a shock that you remembered it for a long time, and even maybe years later, you thought of it and got a little shiver or something like that? Anybody else there with me? Okay, one such for me was an Alfred Hitchcock rerun. And it came out even before I was born, so you know it's an ancient manuscript type thing, but um, it was a, a show called Breakdown by Alfred Hitchcock. And it was called Breakdown. And in this episode, the star was in an automobile accident on a rural road. I said it right this time. On a rural road. And he is so severely paralyzed that when the rescuers come, they think he's dead. And so throughout the whole episode, you're watching what happens as they put him up on the gurney and they put him in the ambulance and they take him to the morgue. The whole episode is his voice saying, guys, I'm alive. No, you don't need to take me here. I need to go to the hospital. I I'm alive. I'm alive. And, and the whole time you're just thinking, oh man, they think he's dead. And then they put him in the morgue and then, then, it, then it reaches this climax when the medical examiner's there and he's got his scalpel out and he's just getting ready to make the incision. And you know, like part of me is like, going, oh, oh, you know, and, and spoiler alert, spoiler alert. So if you want to stick your fingers in your ear, you go, la, 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 just don't make the noise. But anyway, um, just before the knife hits his skin, he cries one tear. And someone sees it and says, wait, 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 wait. I think he's alive. And they saw the tear. And they took him back to the hospital. Of course, it has to have a good ending. He recovers and everything like that. Well, as I was preparing this sermon, this show came to mind. 
Because I was thinking about how unfortunately that's how many Christians are living right now. I'm reminded from the scripture there are many who may believe they're Christians but aren't alive and are merely spiritually dead men walking. Or there are others that spiritually are so paralyzed because of inaction that you have to look really, really, really hard to see that they belong to Jesus. We need revival, don't we? Okay, we need revival. I heard it more and more. Many of you thought about the need for revival for our nation and for our church after the guided prayer last week. I heard a lot of great things from folks about how we had the guided prayer and there's always hope in Christ. It's my hope that we'll leave here this morning an alive and vibrant church on the start of revival just from today. But that comes from our attitude of looking and saying, God, what are you telling me right now? Because this is what I've been struggling with, with this passage, especially this week. Today's sermon is not the first one I've written this week. There, there's a couple others that have been in the trash can for a day or two, as God has been working through me with this. So if you would, turn with me in your Bibles because that's the best place to start and to stay. James chapter 2, we'll be reading verses 14 to 26. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe there is one God? Good. Even demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And I love this line right here. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not faith, by faith alone. In the same way, it was not even the Rah Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the si spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so, the, so faith without deeds is dead. Lord, let's pray that you would just make this word come alive in our lives. And during this time, in your name we pray. Amen. Now, as we begin the scripture and explore how it can change our lives, our church, and our world, I believe it's important to address the concern that many have had over this passage. Now, I want to ask you a question. Have any of y'all ever been in a situation where you, in a, you were in agreement with someone on a topic, but they thought you were disagreeing with them? Maybe it's because you're approaching it from a different angle adding in other consideration or just not using the same verbiage and boom, a conflict arose. You've been there? Frustrating, isn't it? I can tell you as a minister, this happens more often than it should. And I'm always saying that this is important this week with what we're covering, that you listen to me. But sometimes I have to go back and check my notes to see if I really said something I reportedly said. Um, or to see how something may have been taken the wrong way by someone or if I fact in fact, I have erred. And this happens on many fronts, including theology, scriptural interpretation. And what, what gets me is so funny is even politics. Because if you think I'm going to talk politics, especially from the pulpit, you're, kind, you're, you're wrong. You know, politics, that was my brother's world. You know, I vote. But, but, you know, I believe talking about Jesus, not politics, is what God's called me to do. It's just a side sermon there. We can do that another time. But anyway... Uh, but I want to add to you that here, if you have a question about something that I've said, something I've posted on Facebook or whatever, um, I welcome you to talk to me about it. Often we may not be in disagreement at all, or if it is, maybe we can reach an agreement or at least hopefully respect each other's perspective and prayerfully agree to disagree 
while seeking the Holy Spirit's discernment on what the, the truth is about the subject. Are we, are we okay with that? As we can do that? All right. Now, the passage we're exploring today is seen by many as in conflict with Paul's teaching of us being saved by grace, especially Ephesians 2, 8, 9, where it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not from yourselves. That's a key line right there. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one could boast. Now, I'm going to make it clear right from the beginning, and you'll hear me say it several times, we cannot work our way into heaven. Do we understand that? Salvation is a gift of God through Jesus Christ. Okay? But a faith that is real and genuine includes works. And that is the, the wrestle right there that we have in, in talking with that. I hope you can agree in that Paul and James are not telling us that we're either saved by faith or by works, but that it's thanks to the grace of God we're saved through both faith and action. And we'll talk about that right there in just a moment. But the true faith, the faith that's only given by God's grace, changes lives. And there are several scriptures that speak to the importance of what we do with our faith. And it's usually how they work together in faith. Look at Jesus. Um, some ones if you just want to write down to look up later on. Um, Luke chapter 3 verse 8. Matthew chapter 3 verse 8. They both say, produce, keep, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Keep, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Here's a tough one here. A tough, tough teaching that, that we'll look at sometime in the future hopefully. But Matthew 7, 19 to 23. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. This is Jesus talking, by the way. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me you evildoers. Paul spoke of the necessity of works as an outflow of our faith. It says in Romans 14, 12, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And then Paul, even in his testimony about his Damascus Road encounter with King Agrippa, spoke of how faith and works work together. It says this in Acts 26, 15 through 20. When I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me, and I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and the, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sin and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the Gentiles also. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That's Paul talking. That's why it's important for us as we look at scriptures, instead of pulling one out and saying, oh, this is in contradiction with everything else, to do as it says in 2 Timothy 3.15 and study scripture. We are saved by grace alone. It's an act of faith. But true faith, faith means we have to do something more than merely have a belief that Jesus came and lived and died for us. We must put this belief, this belief in action for ourselves, which could be defined as work. We're going to, again, explore this a little bit more, but the Holy Spirit directed the writing of the Bible, and the Bible does not contradict itself, and it will not contradict itself. That's why we have to study scriptures. So let's dig a little bit deeper in this as we're talking about the faith and works issues. This chapter gives us, uh, this part of the scripture gives us really three types of faith or belief. Now the first one is a dead faith. Now true faith requires action. The action that it requires from the very beginning, for it to be a true faith for us is surrender. We have to surrender ourselves to God. 
Now the wording of verse 14, if you're following along in your Bible, is very important for us to take note of. He says, what good is it if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Now the wording here about a claim of faith, and also says such a faith, is really important. As we explore more detail in a few minutes, such a faith is a mere belief. It's a mental assent, if you will, assent, if you will that yeah, I believe in God. How many of you heard someone say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus. But you know they don't have a relationship with them. You can believe it, but even recite a prayer, go forward at the, at the end of the service. But if your claimed faith has never claimed you, then it's not a lie. And it's claimed, or it was never claimed by you fully, for you've given your life to Jesus. He said at the end of the judgment day, he said, Lord, Lord, we did this or that. He said, I'll never know, I never knew you. To have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you at least, to have eternal life, you at least, to know a living faith, you at least need to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and truly give your life to him. Just believing it doesn't make it happen. Does that make sense? But there are a lot of people that have never gotten past the point of that. Scripture is here, it's clear that when we have Jesus in our lives, we become changed people. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. It doesn't say that we may be changed, it says we are. He is a new creation. I don't know what changes needed to happen in your life or may need to happen in your life for you to be a new creation. But God knows, and I believe we probably know for ourselves. Now before I go any further in the sermon, I want to say that as we read last week, we have no right to judge one another. And folks, that is not what I'm doing here. But we are, however, commanded to declare the truth of God and to encourage one another to judge ourselves and see where do we stand in our relationship to God. And that's what I'm begging all of us to do today. Are you a different person than you were before Jesus came into your life, before you accepted Jesus? If not, why not? Now, some might say, well, be honest, Brian, I was always a pretty good person you know I grew up in a Christian home I didn't really sin a whole lot at least none of the big ones we talked about that last week didn't we but anyway um, none of the big ones I've been a pretty good person all my life in fact my testimony is kind of dull and boring you know I've heard kids say that before say well Brian man I don't have one of these great testimonies that I was out doing drugs and I was out you know killing people that I was out doing all these things I just I just grew up in a Christian home and accepted Jesus and I've been trying to follow him the whole way through and I said that's not a dull and boring testimony that's a testimony where you say God thank you I did not have to live through all that other junk if that's you don't put it down say praise God I was put in a great environment where I could grow in faith I was put in a great environment where early on I could see that Jesus had a plan for my life and early on I was able to follow that and I didn't have to go through a lot of the pain the hurt the anguish the loss that so many others have I guarantee you if you talk to the majority of the people who have one of those glamorous testimonies they would have traded with you in a heartbeat to have known Jesus at an early age and have a life like that. But still, even if you were a good person, great. But what about your heart? Do you have a desire to seek a deep relationship with Jesus? See, that's one of the problems we can have if we've been kind of insulated in church. And I don't mean that in a negative way. But we think, I go to church, I do good. But what about that deep relationship? Do you have that desire to grow closer and really say, God, what do you want to do with me? Are you heartbroken for your sin? Are you burdened for the loss, for the lost around us? And does this desire, this heartbrokenness and burden cause you to act upon it? If not, and again, I'm not judging, I'm asking you to prayerfully seek the Lord about this. 
you may only claim to know Jesus or at your best your faith is severely paralyzed and the best you can manage is, is maybe sort of a tear of action in your life and if we don't have that we need to self-examine and see God what are you calling me to do for you see speaking of the paralyzed in, in Mike Burnett's favorite story when the man came down on the mat and he was healed Jesus said to him what pick up your mat your sins are forgiven pick up your mat go and walk he didn't say I, I've, I've healed you but you know what you need to do keep laying on the mat and let your friends carry you everywhere because they've been doing that for so long they're used to it that's what you're used to that's comfortable don't disrupt your life don't change anything else you've been healed you can walk but oh don't do it just lay there that's the life you know of course not of course not in the same way Jesus saves us not only for eternity but to be world changers James illustrates this again talking about the poor and trying to drive the point home in verses 15 and 16 when he says what good does it do to tell someone who is cold and hungry to be warm and well fed but does nothing to meet his physical needs or now it might even be you add in by taking a video of it saying look at this poor person they're, they're shivering they're hungry somebody ought to really do something let's get a Facebook pledge for them and then you walk away when you've got access to food and a warm jacket on that faith does no good a living faith changes lives and that's what we need to be about something that really struck me hard this week in preparing and thinking about it I asked myself this this question if the Lord returns before I die or when a friend or an acquaintance that I have passes that doesn't know Jesus and I have never shared Jesus with them would it be good enough if we even could to turn to him and say sorry about that my bad no our faith if it is alive has action now some may mistakenly read that that verse 18 says that we can work our way to heaven or that that it's it's a result of our our action what he's talking about here is he's illustrating that how you show your faith is by what you do verse 18 says someone will say you have faith I have deeds show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do it's not an either or so I'm again making it clear you can't work your way to heaven and James was talking about this belief as a mere assent and the true belief results in repentance and giving our lives to Jesus and that is what what saves as we've already seen throughout scripture in Romans 4 it talks about the futility of trying to work the way to heaven above all if nothing else read John 14 6 where Jesus says I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the Father but by me he doesn't say I am the way the truth and the life and if you come to me or if you do a lot of good things you're good you're covered because all good people go to heaven Jesus never said that that's a lie straight from the pit of hell but how often is it either believed or said or we assent to that and say well they're good they're okay it says in Romans 10 9 if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart again more than an assent but that believing in your heart is like committing your soul to it then that God raised him from the dead you will be saved again there is action here there is action here. It is only through Jesus that we are saved. The reason I'm pointing this out is as I've heard from people more than once, I know that those that believe that, that if someone does some, some good things or if they died in the war for the U.S. or they died doing something heroic, they will automatically go to heaven. But Scripture is clear that we cannot work our way to heaven. I personally know of people who have traveled the world doing some great, great things. But when they've heard the gospel, when it's been shared with them, they've rejected it. They don't think they need it or they don't believe it to be true. And as good as they are, 
they will not be with Jesus in paradise. They will not spend eternity with Jesus in heaven until they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I'm just tr stating scriptural facts here. As Coleman Luck pointed out, one must make a real transaction with the Lord. We surrender our life to gain eternal and abundant life in Christ. That is the only way. So the first type of faith is a dead faith, and I'm going to give us a little out here, maybe a severely paralyzed, tear-only faith. Second one, and this is tough, but it's in the scripture here, is a demonic faith. This too is dead, but it has some distinctives. Verse 19 says, you believe there's one God? Good! Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. From the encounters with Jesus in the Gospels, and throughout Scripture, it's clear that the forces of evil know that Jesus is the Son of God. That the forces of evil know that He's the Savior and He has ultimate power. However, it makes no difference to them and they still try to work to do as much damage as possible. Folks, there are unfortunately people who live that way. They stubbornly refuse to accept Jesus even though they know it's true. As it says in Romans 2.8, But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. You've got to know the truth to reject it. So there are people that will just, to their peril, refuse to accept Jesus. But, but, fortunately, as long as, they're as long as they live, there is still hope that they can come to Jesus. Now I believe that there are those within the sound of my voice, either in this room or online, who if they were honest, would say that their faith is either dead, demonic, or at best, tear only paralyzed. Dead in that there's never been a time when Jesus has come to their, into their lives. They do not have eternal life. The Holy Spirit is, is not living in them. If that's you, give Jesus your life and allow Him to make your faith truly alive. There is so much more to living faith than you can ever imagine. So much more. The other thing about those who have a de demonic faith is they know the truth and they even realize that if they gave their lives to Jesus that they would be changed and they don't want it or they fear that change. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. To truly live the Christian life, it means living differently. You may have to give up things, relationships and even beliefs that you have once held dear that have sustained you. God wants more for you. Sin matters. Sin is not God's ideal plan. But those with the de de demonic faith can be ones that I'm going to live however I want. I don't care what God says. Faith makes a difference. But the good thing about it, God loves sinners more than we do because He always wants the best for us. And in the scripture, he is not afraid to share that truth. If we love like Jesus, we too will share his truth. Now, honestly, it's hard for me to say some of the things I'm saying today. I know it's called, maybe causing some discomfort in your life. It's caused it in mine. I struggle with the depth of Jesus' love for us and his desires for us and how poorly we often or I often live it out. But, as I say, there's always hope. There's one more faith talked about in this chapter. And that is an act of working faith. This is a faith that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it starts to change with us that causes the chain, react, chain reaction in our lives that causes us to live out our faith and service and love to others. No, it's not a thing. Susan said to me, what, you say a prayer and automatically you're perfect and those things you're struggling with are gone? No, I'm not saying that. But as we give ourselves to the Lord, if some people has happened, I know some people said that, you know, I, I gave it to the Lord, I put that drink down, and boom, I was done. I put those drugs down, boom, I was done. Different things like that. For some of us, it's a process, it's a battle. But we have the Holy Spirit and living faith working with us. If it's not a battle and just losing to it, that's when you got to look, am I really alive? I think it's amazing here that God uses Abraham and Rahab as examples of the true living of faith. I mean, Abraham was the Abraham. You know, Father Abraham from the song. 
Father Abraham, the father of, of Israel, the father of our faith, Father Abraham. We're talking the Abraham. And God's talking about he was justified when he was promised a son. And what was so cool is he had a son in his very old age. And I still love talking that story, sharing that story with the youth and some of them going, ooh. But anyway, um, you know, he had a son in old age, very old age. And, and this is his precious son. And God said, sacrifice him. What, God? Sacrifice him. And he had the willingness to do what God was trying to do. And then, then just before, God always has perfect timing. God says, hold the knife. Hold the knife. There's a sacrifice for you. His faithfulness to follow God, no matter what, showed faith in action. The other person, Rahab, was a foreigner and, we'll put it lightly, a woman of, of ill repute. She was not in an acceptable occupation. But through surrender of God, to, to God, excuse me, not of God, to God, she showed a living faith and things were changed. In fact... She is listed with the heroes of the faith in, faith in Hebrews 11. Talk about these two. And I'll look at it and say, you used this woman and Abraham together? Thank you, God. Because what it tells me is no one is too far gone for God to use. No one is too far gone to have a relationship with God. No one is too far gone for God to say, here I am. Let me change your life and give you something brand new. Surrender to me. Let your faith come alive as I come alive in your life. Maybe you're a parent here and you've been brokenhearted for that child, for that son or daughter that is nowhere near living the life in Christ that you want them to live. They may even be rejecting Christ and far from that lifestyle. There is still hope as long as they're breathing. Maybe you're a grandparent dealing with that. Maybe you're a, a, a child of a parent. Maybe even an older child of a parent. But your parents are still around and they don't, know Je they don't know Jesus. No one is too far gone for God to save. No one is too far gone. That neighbor, maybe that neighbor that you can't stand and doesn't know Jesus, he's not too far gone. That person that you love so dearly, that is so good, that is so nice. One of your favorite people, they don't know Jesus, and they can sometimes be the hardest ones to lead to Christ. They are not too far gone. They're not too far out of the mix. But it takes more than mental belief. It takes full surrender to Jesus and the power of Holy Spirit for us to become new creations through whom God works. Well, this week I was looking through some old sermons and when I say old sermons, I'm talking 20, 30 years ago, a long time ago. Because I had this kind of poor filing system. Most of them, most of them until about probably 20 years ago, were written on, um, on legal pads. And I would print them and then I would, I mean write them, and then I would fold them and put them in my Bible. And when I was through using them, my great filing system was to take it out of my Bible and put it in either this notebook or a file. And so I've got this stack that I finally this week said, I'm going to go through some of those. And I was going through them and suddenly packed in them. I thought, oh, this must be a good one. It's good and thick. And I opened it up and it was nothing but blank pages that I'd filed in my normal way in that filing cabinet. And at first, and I think maybe this was, was the enemy, I don't know, I was convicted. A reminder of thinking, I wonder if this is supposed to represent things I should have said, actions I could have done to make a difference in someone's life and I didn't. But then God revealed another take on it to me. These pages are blank. Words are yet to be written on them. Pictures are yet to be drawn on them. And I thought, this to me represents the days I have left or the hours or moments I have left. I have no idea. Today may be my last. I may be around for another 30. Who knows? God does. But whatever I have left, I need to use those days to make a difference. And I'm trying to use this as, as an illustration of myself. On one of them, I've already written a note to one of my former students and put it in the care package that's going to be mailed to him. 
I'm going to take these with me in Baltimore to see if maybe I need to use them to encourage someone there. Maybe I'll write a Bible stu study with it. Maybe I'll give it to a child, one of the pages that needs to, a piece of paper to draw a picture. I don't know, but these are all opportunities that God will give me to make my faith alive as I'm sharing with others. Because we sometimes have no idea the little things, what they mean to someone else came across a story about that this week. There was a man throughout his life, he was apparently a pretty famous communicator, a very successful man, and he shared over and over and over again to people that the day that changed his life, he knew the exact date and year was the day that his dad took him fishing, this one particular day. And the things that they had talked about, what they had done, their time together had such a profound effect on his life that it changed his life completely and he credited a lot of his success to that day being sp spent, the day was, that was spent fishing with his dad. Well, his dad apparently was also a famous guy and there was a library there with him and he had these journals. They said, you know, his dad journaled a lot. Let's go back and get the adult perspective on that day from his dad. And so they went through, they found the date and they went to it and the journal said, on that date, took my son fishing, a wasted day. Folks, when we love others, when we serve in God's name, there are going to be times when we feel like either I did it wrong or that just didn't work. It was a wasted day. But when we're doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit and God's hands are upon it, we may never realize this side of heaven how life-changing that day was, that moment was. Just as that father had no idea that day how he changed the life of his son, we have no idea what our faithfulness can do in the kingdom of God for others. Is your faith the living one? Jesus' bride is not a corpse and church buildings should not be fancy coffins encasing faith dead people it's time that we who claim Christ raise up from our slumber and make Jesus known to this world if you know that you know that you know that you surrendered your life to Jesus is your life showing it if you don't know, you can know for sure today. Does your life show that living faith? You know, it said that the average church that even tries to do this has two people come to Christ each year through the ministry of their church. Two for the average church. You might say, well, we do a whole lot better than that. We've already baptized five this year. Okay, yes, we do. But I think the question we all and I point to myself with this need to ask ourselves, if it were the result of my personal outreach, how many people would hear the saving message of Jesus Christ? They have to hear to respond. And a living faith is contagious and reproduces. Many of us, as I said before, know the need and we want revival in our church, in our land. The response to last week's guided prayer from several folks was, we need more of that. We need to pray for revival. And in the near future, I want to do some services where we are hopefully on our knees, on our faces before God and praying for revival in our church and in our land. But you know what's so much more important to that? If you've got a car, you can pray for revival in your car. If you have a home, you can pray for revival in your home. If you're walking down the street, you can pray for revival because praying for revival starts with saying, God, revive me. Come alive in my life. Show off through me, God. Get me out of the way. Cleanse my heart. Make me the man or woman you want me to be. And when we start becoming revived, guess what? Our church becomes revived. Our nation becomes revived. The world becomes revived. I don't think we're too far gone. Some have said to me, you know, we're not going to grow anymore as a church. I disagree with that. If we commit ourselves to God and say, God, show off through me, give us an alive faith, we become an alive church, we will grow because the gates of hell can't close us in. Jesus has already taken care of that. Call upon Jesus to revive you 
And as we all do this, revival will come. Think about this. When Doc was little, he was obsessed with the whole concept of evidence. I kind of like it. His dad's a cop, so I kind of like him being interested in what his dad was doing. But any time I tried to teach him anything, he would say to me, well, buddy, what's the evidence for that? Every time. And so finally I said to him, Doc, what is evidence? And he said, you know, it's the stuff that shows what happened and who did it. And I thought, that's pretty good for a four-year-old. I thought of that this week, spending some time with him at one point, and it reminded me of a question I was asked as a teenager that some of you may have heard it before too. If being a Christian was a crime, would there be enough evidence against you to gain a conviction? I've never forgotten that. Sometimes, and I hate to admit it, there were days in the past where the answer was no, there's not enough. But I hope and pray that those days are forever my past. And if your answer is no, let's make it in the past as well. Ask Jesus today to make this church not a church with dead faith, demonic faith, or even severely paralyzed faith. But ask God to make this a church, starting with ourselves, a church full of living faith that's active and changes the world. Let's pray together. Father God, I pray that, that we would wake from whatever slumber we may be in. Lord, that we would look and see where you're calling us to meet needs and to live out your gospel message as, as you give us opportunities. Lord, I pray that as we sing, Lord, that we would spend time praying for revival, revival of our church, revival of ourselves, revival of our nation. Lord, I pray that during this time as we sing that we could see what type of, type of faith we have in our life and respond to you by saying, God, give me that living faith. Lord, I pray that you'd let us leave here a changed people to change the world because you've revived us again. Lord, as we sing, let us listen to you and allow you to change us. In your name we pray. Amen. The altar is open as we stand and sing, respond as God has called. I lose, I will follow you. I will follow you. Light into the world, light into my life. I will live for you alone. You're the one I seek, knowing I so much um, being able to serve and work with this church. Again, I ask your prayers as we head up. I'm, like I said, I'm heading out shortly after the service and going up there and just uh, 
looking forward to what God's going to do. I appreciate that. And um, I'm going to ask Steve Jones this time to come and share our benediction and offertory prayer. Folks, like, thank you for the chance to send us home, if you will. The, the, the prayer makes me think about the service, and, and it inspires me, hopefully, to, uh, to, to reach out to others. So, so let's pray, please. Father God, for safe travels, we, we, we thank you for the kids going to Baltimore, for, for Brian to follow. Be, be with them. Uh, keep them safe. Uh, dear Lord, I've, we, we've sung beautiful songs to you. We've, we've talked about your name. Uh, we've been challenged to, to let our actions be the message, to convey the message that, that you say. Uh, dear God, I can't help but think that, that those words are great, but maybe somebody on the sidewalk out front hears them, but that's about as far as it's going to go. Uh, dear God, you can, by our actions, let us reach a lot of folks, and we just, I ask you to show me who you'd have me touch and make sure that that message that you love us enough to save us comes through. Thank you for each one here for the gifts, whether it's time, whether it's, it's money, whatever we can give. Please accept it. Please use it. Uh, let us lift up your name. And thank you for this time to worship together. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.